All right, art historians, we have done it. We have made it to the very last um, uh, video of our um, late Europe section. Um, you should be um, amazed with your uh, accomplishments and impressed with how much we have learned um, in our time during late Europe. Um, this has been a very um, long unit and a unit that covers uh, a huge span of time and a huge um, amount of different um, artistic uh, images. Um, you're really looking at, you know, just like a ton of pieces, 60 some odd pieces, I think, that we've done in this unit. And you should be very proud of yourselves. Um, okay, so let's talk about site art. What is site art? Site art is any artwork that is created at a particular place and meant to be viewed at that particular place. Um, so, um, you know, it takes place on a particular at a particular location. Okay, so let's look at this. Our first example of site art is um, uh, a, a piece called uh, Narcissus Garden um, by Yayoi Kusuma. Um, and Kusuma is um, she is still alive, um, and she is an interesting interesting, interesting character. Um, <laughs> uh, and there's really, you know, not a lot of other ways to describe her. Um, she is, um, uh, she's Japanese. She's a contemporary artist. She works primarily in sculpture and installation, but she does also do performance. She has been very famous recently for doing a, a bunch of, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to skip ahead for a second because this you may be familiar with. She's done a bunch of these installations, infinity rooms and things like this. Um, this is what she looks like today. This is what Kusuma looks like today. Um, and she is classically trained um, and she's considered to be the most important living Japanese artist and one of the most important modern Japanese artists. Um, she uh, suffers from... Uh, mental illness, and um, she has um, consistently lived in um, a um, a mental health facility. Um, she has um, she has said that she has had um, um, hallucinations um, since uh, she uh, was very young. Um, her parents were, at, well, at least her mother um, was um, physically abusive. Her father was emotionally abusive. And she says that she uses her art as a way to, um, to express herself and to, to deal with um, her, her feelings and things like that. Um, so, you know, she has studied lots of modern artists. Um, she, you know, had a long-term friendship with um, with some other, you know, s strong American artists like um, like George O'Keefe, um, uh, and um, so. What's interesting about her is that she. <laughs> She is a difficult person to really, um, to really like, um, and it has a lot to do with um, the way she um, sort of shoves her way into the art world at times, um, and the way that she is sort of unapologetic for some of the installations of her work or the or the repetitions of her work. Um, she, she is, you know, she's a major, major figure in contemporary art. Um, and this exhibit, this infinity um, mirrors exhibit is, is huge. Um, uh, so, um, but 
the problem is, is that much of her early work um, came from a place of, um, I don't know how to say it, cutting in line is the best way that I can really, really talk about um, what, what she did. Um, and so I'm going to go back then to um, our first image, um, uh, Narcissus Garden. And I would like you to look at the fact that while that is modern day Paris, that is modern, modern, modern day Paris, um, uh, uh, the first installation of this work, the, this um, collection of mirrored um, balls, uh, either in water or on land, um, began um, in 1966. And I think um, the reason that it, it's sort of difficult to um, to really be a, a huge, you know, fan of, of her, you know, feminist work is, is the idea that she, um, she sort of got there, um, in a, in a way that was not necessarily fair. Um, and, and I know that that sounds like I'm being a little kid. Well, that's not fair. Um, but really that is, that is really what happened. Okay. So let's talk about it. Venice Biennale. What exactly is the Venice Biennale? The Venice Biennale is a biannual, happens every other year, uh, art festival that takes place in Venice, Italy. Um, countries are allowed to um, invite um, uh, artists to come and represent their um, their country in sort of these pavilions. So here's the deal. Um, in the 1966 Venice Biennale, um, and how you spell Biennale is B-I-E-N-N-A-L-E. -N -N -E. um, in the 1966 Venice Biennale, she was not invited um, to participate. Um, and instead of, you know, doing what she was supposed to do, which is n not participate, um, she, this is the image, 1966, she showed up anyway. Um, and she went into um, the, the Biennale without permission, um, and she attempted to show her work um, at the Biennale ag against the wishes of the Biennale Committee. Um, and, and, and this is why I say she sort of, you know, shoved her way in line. It, it, like, I, I almost have this idea of her, you know, with her elbow just poking people and being like, I'm, I'm getting in here. Um, and, and that is sort of the, you know, one of the reasons that she comes with a little bit of, you know, baggage to her, um, to her artwork. So many of her images, uh, many of her works, uh, deal with reflective images, mirrors, um, and things like that. Um, and narcissism, Narcissus was a, um, a, mem a figure of um, in mythology who was so in love with himself um, that he um, stared at his own reflection and um, until he disappeared. So, so Narcissus Garden, a garden made of you know this um, you know this view of herself. Um, so a lot of her works involve mirrors. A lot of her works involve um, herself being in them. Um, she has been um, described as being a, 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 a ridiculous narcissist. Um, uh, the art critic Jody Cutler once said that she has an unusual and egotistic um, admiration for herself. Um, she really um, is really just, it, it, she is consumed with uh, her need to be important and her need to be seen. Um, and that really started with this um, installation. So this is a copy of the installation um, in Paris in 2010. Um, here's another copy of the installation in Central Park in Manhattan in 2004. Um, there was another, there have been several other copies. I think there was one in Brazil in the 1990s. Um, and so, 
um, you know, this piece, the specific piece, Narcissus Garden, has been shown um, many times. So let's talk about this particular image. So she shows up um, on the, she shows up at the Venice Biennale and she puts these, these mirrored spheres um, on the ground uh, with a sign that says, your own narcissism for sale. And she sold each of these mirrored spheres for $2. Um, and she was dressed there in the gold kimono with a silver sash. Um, and um, think about how reflective they are. They would reflect the buildings. They would reflect the sky. They would reflect her sash. They would reflect her. Um, and they would reflect her hundreds of times. Um, 1,500 uh, that is how many there are. In the original installation, there were 1,500. Um, they were originally made of plastic. Um, now they are um, made of um, uh, a lightweight um, mirrored, um, like a heavier material than just like standard. Like this is just cheap plastic. Um, so she makes you think about or what she wants you to think about is it's kind of like a fortune teller's ball, right? She wants you to think about the reflections that would appear in them, not only um, her, herself, yourself, the architecture, the landscape, but that the images would be distorted uh, because of the, the roundness of the sphere. Um, and she is really into serious, serious um, self-promotion. Now, what's interesting is she says um, when she um, first began this installation um, that she was trying to, to protest the commercialism of art. Um, and again, this is why she sometimes comes across as a, a not incredibly likable person, because if you're trying to protest the commercialism of art, then why would you bust your way into the Venice Biennale um, when you weren't invited and sell these, these mirrored spheres? Um, she was asked by the com committee, the Biennale Committee, to leave. Um, uh, and um, eventually um, she was forced to um, she was forced to stop selling them and she was forced to leave the Biennale. But they actually left the um, the spheres there, the the, mir the mirrored spheres there. I think that it's my personal opinion. I think that that is really one of the starting points for when she was like, okay, I can get away with just about anything because while they made her leave, they left her exhibit up. Um, and while she says she was against the commercialism of art, once the Biennale was over, she did in fact sell all of the spheres. Um, so, um, and she's been commissioned to reinstall um, the this installation with you know, stainless steel spheres that are very expensive, and then she sells those after. Um, so the idea that she is against the commercialism of art is, is again, part of her persona. Um, she was eventually um, invited to the 45th Biennale in 1993 to represent Japan, and that really moved into her into the time with all of these um, these dots. That's when she entered sort of this. Um, you know, she is um, her work is intriguing and interesting, and her work is very cool to look at. Um, the Infinity Rooms, um, you know, they sold out as fast as as you could get a ticket. Um, and I did try to get a ticket. Uh, I won't, I won't deny that I tried, but, um, it, there, it's very difficult to get into one of the, um, infinity rooms. Um, and you know, uh, it's very hard to get in to see her work. Um, and so, um, the work is good. The work is beautiful. The work is um, very interesting. Um, in 2017, um, a, a museum dedicated to her opened up in Tokyo. Um, and so she is, you know, she's, she's still very, very popular. Um, you know, she says that her works are to be fully immersive. Uh, she says that her works are meant to, um, to echo the way that your because the the images are overwhelming you're surrounded by them they're meant to echo the way that you're sort of overwhelmed by the thoughts in your head um and um 
you know, that, that you often feel like you are, you're trapped. Um, and so that is some of the, her later work, what she is, um, trying to accomplish. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, Yayo Kusuma. Um, and so those are, um, original installation and performance, 1966 mirror. Um, the original ones were plastic. The new ones are stainless steel. Uh, and, um, you know, this is her later work. All right, moving on, Spiral Jetty. Okay, this was installed by Robert Smithson in 1970 out in the Great Salt Lake in Utah. Um, uh, it is really, really cool. Um, the colors that you see there are naturally occurring. Um, it is what we refer to as an earthwork. Um, so much like our um, Great Serpent Mound, um, but I would like you to look at mud, uh, precipitated salt crystals, um, rocks, uh, and a water coil 1,500 feet long. Okay, so that this coil here, right, 1,500 feet. Okay, so it's it's a a, a big um, installation, um, and so you know you're looking at. Um, you know, you're looking at a third of a mile. I think that's the math. Um, you know, the, the if we stretch that out, um, you're you're looking at um, it's 15 feet wide. So from here to here, um, and I I want to um, scroll in a little bit to the next one so that you can sort of really get um, how big this is. So. Um, the water in the uh, Great Salt Lake does change color depending on how um, much salt there is naturally occurring, how, how deep the water is. But this gives you an idea of how, how big this is. Those are people. Um, it's giant. Um, and these are, uh, you know, scenes from above. So, um, you know, your photo, your original photo is taken from a helicopter okay, so that you can really see it. I'm going to teach it looking here because I really want you to see the the piece. So you hear the see the shoreline here, right? The shoreline, and then you see it coil. Okay. So one more time, Smithson, 1970, earthwork. All right. So we're going to go here, circular composition. So the dirt and the rocks are moved um, into a spiral form. How do you do that? Well, you have to do that with big giant ridiculous massive trucks and things and people and equipment. Um, and so uh, what's cool about this is um, it is site specific. Unlike Narcissus Garden, which you could just pick up and move to a different place, this is site specific. This can't just be picked up and moved um, because the dirt and the rocks are taken from their space and moved into that particular piece. Um, it is meant to uh, according to the artist, it's not just Mrs. Norman talking, it is meant to um, underline the idea that art can be a communal process, a thing where people work together, um, that the artist does not necessarily have to be the end all and be all of a work of art. Um, it also reminds us that art does not have to be contained inside a museum or inside a controlled environment, that people can have access to art where they can look at and touch and interact with the art. Um, and that there, there needs to be this concept that a gallery or a museum is not the only place to see art. And that what fits into a gallery or a museum is not the only kind of art there is. Um, and he wants you to expand your thinking about where art can be and what art can look like and how art can change or how, um, you know, art can be timeless or fleeting. What's interesting about this particular work is, you know, massive trucks were used, lots of people were used, shovels and bulldozers and all kinds of stuff. It's in a, it's in huge proportions, right? Like 1500 feet long. But also what's cool is you can walk on it 
you can walk on the the earth part you can walk in it in the water part depending on how high the water is sometimes the level of great salt lake comes up so high that it part of it is submerged okay part of it is um you know sometimes all of it is visible um it, it is now part of the environment of great salt lake and it seems both permanent because it's mud and rock, but it also seems sort of changeable because depending on the height of the water and, and stuff like that is how much of it is visible. Um, he says that um, he was influenced by um, ancient landforms like Great Servant Mound, um, like uh, lines, like the Nazca lines and things like that. Um, uh, earthworks like, um, you know, the, the burial mounds in Ireland. And so he wanted to sort of take uh, ancient ideas and also make them feel more modern. Um, and he also enjoyed the idea that um, you, depending on where you stand, um, it looks different, um, whether you're standing in the center um, whether you're standing over here, whether you're standing in the water, whether you're standing up on this berm, whether you're up in a helicopter or whether you're looking at it from the, from, you know, from just outside of it, you know, like, the, and you'll see that there's a hill here. So you can go up on the hill and look down on it. Um, and he loved the idea that there were a million different ways to look at this installation and that none of them was exactly the right way. And you could take a photo of it but it might not always look like that. Um, and so again, this concept that what is in a museum or a gallery is not all that art is, that art can be other things and that the artist does not have to complete these things alone, um, that, that art can be part of a group creation. Um, you know, he he's really cool. Um, and it's a really cool um, installation. My friends, this is the very last image in our late Europe uh, category. Um, so this is called postmodern. So what's the difference between modernism and postmodernism? Well, modernism was based on sort of idealism and things being perfect and using like our, you know, the, all this thinking and intellectualism to, to really like get those sleek lines and stuff like that. Postmodernism um, has a tendency to be um, sort of a little bit less ideal and idealized and more a little bit of skeptical of like what's going on. When you think about design, modernism tends to be incredibly minimalist while postmodernism tends to have um, less minimalism and more um, uh, kind of complex designs. Um, I feel like this is one of those times where I'm just super honest with you. I feel like there are a million postmodern buildings they could have selected, um, and I am not a huge fan of the one that they pick, but that's okay. Um, I love Robert Venturi um, and Denise Scott Brown. I just don't think this is their best building. All right. So what we're looking at is the house in Newcastle County. It is in Delaware. You could drive right up to Delaware and see it. Um, your architects are Robert Venturi, John Rausch, and Denise Scott Brown. Venturi and Denise Scott Brown were married to each other, and this um, creation was part of their architectural firm. Now, in the late, mid to late 70s, Robert Venturi was considered to be one of the most influential architectural theorists, like this idea of what things could look like. Um, he believed that like this strict minimalist um, modern art architecture had run its course and it was just too stark and it was too simplified and it was too machiney, you know, like 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 Corbusier said, a machine for living. That's how he described Villa Savoy. And by this point in 78, Venturi was like, that's too stark. It's too minimalist. It's too 
nothingness, right? It needs life. It needs vitality. Um, he actually, one of his famous, favorite buildings is Hagia Sophia, um, but Hagia Sophia in its current state with the additions of the minarets and with the additions of some external prayer areas and with the additions and the changes inside. Um, and he, he referred to liking what he called, quote, the messy vitality of old buildings, end quote. Um, and so when I say messy vitality, like they they don't feel like they follow a, a certain form. They don't, they don't feel unified. They're just like a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit. And and vitality is, is that it's a living, changing thing. Um, and so he wrote this book on architecture um, that is still taught in architecture schools called Complexity and Contradiction, um, that, that like buildings should look how buildings look and how we perceive them um, is way more important than like the the theories that you use to build them. He wants buildings to look like they're a combination of ideas. Um, he wants things to be complex and busy and messy and vitality and all of that stuff. Um, and he what you can see here is he definitely borrowed ideas um, and forms from different eras, wood frame and stucco. But I want you to look at this. This is wood. This is a wood frame that is made to look like a giant Doric temple. But that's just wood. Like that's a wood panel. It's not really a temple. This is an Italian Palladian window. Um, these are ancient colonial windows. Your peak here is Greek. Um, so you have this sort of um, odd construction of a colonnade, which is a, a row of columns, um, a, a tympanum, that you know rounded arch, a pediment. Um, it's almost, I, I, I once heard it described as um, a cartoon version of a Greek temple. Um, and, you know, when you're thinking about it, I want you to see that this is, this facade sits out multiple feet from the actual window. You can see the window in the back, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight panels of glass. And then in front of it, is where you see this sort of um, half moon, it's called a demi-loon window, this rounded window. So when we go inside and we're inside, here's some of the windows and we can see that arched panel that is, that is out there, right? So you can see you have your arched panel and then you can see from inside you have the arched panel. Um, a lot of decorations that are wood that are cut out to be a certain shape. You can see that in these, um, these wooden arches that are put there simply for decoration. They are not load bearing um, and they're painted with these odd colors um, and designs. This is the music room of this house. And the reason that I want you to see it is um, it, it's huge. This is a pipe organ. That is two grand pianos nestled into each other with a harpsichord, a cello, and a violin. This is, these, while this is um, their own, it says private spaces because this is a home, um, it is also like it, the, the, this specifics of the characteristics of it is huge, right? We're seeing early canned lights. Um, you know, but he builds them into this arch to help hide them. Um, we're seeing those more of those, you know, like I said, the wood cutouts outside, the wood cutouts inside, this odd light fixture made up of canned lights and bulbs that hang down. The, it, it is this idea of things being where modernism had everything being minimalized and taken down to only the most bare bones um, this is about, you know, spacious interiors that have lots of decoration, but that are influenced by classical forms. Um, and so what you see here is a home that, you know, definitely shows us what um, 
he was trying to get at with this exterior that looked like a temple and the interior that looks a little bit like a carnival set. Um, and so this is that postmodernism where we just sort of throw reason and minimalism out the window and try for something totally different. Now, the last little bit of this um, uh, uh, video, and you can turn it off now if you want, because that's all of your AP required images for late Europe. But sometimes I just like to roll you through some of the images um, that I think that you need to know. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning and talk about some of the pieces that I've stuck in here um, that, you know, that we didn't really talk about um, all the way back to the beginning. So we're back at the beginning. And um, when we're talking about some of these images that we don't talk about, um, let's get to the, you know, we talk, we did this Goya, but this is one of the most famous paintings that Goya ever did about the Mexican revolution against the, um, the French soldiers that come in and against Napoleon. This is really, really an important, important piece of, um, of, of history and the Christ image that's here is, is amazing. Raft of the Medusa, one of the most famous paintings that exists is giant format. At 16 feet by 23 and a half feet. It really is um, a, a beautiful composition of um, a seascape, um, of portraiture, of disaster, um, uh, of the dimensions of the human body. Um, it is a stunning piece. It's at the Louvre. Um, and um, it is, they consider it the piece that drove Jericho mad um, because he used to go to the morgue and um, based his drawings of the dead and decomposing bodies um, on bodies that were at the morgue. Um, and and uh, there are a lot of art historians that believe that this is the piece that sent Jericho um, literally over the edge. Um, so um, then we get into what are some others that we haven't that we didn't study. Let's scroll forward. Um, and The Thinker by Rodin, probably one of the most, his most famous paintings. I'm sorry, sculptures. This There is a copy of this at the Baltimore Museum of Art in Baltimore, uh, if you wanted to see it. Um, what else haven't I taught you? This is Jean Singer Sargent. This is a realist piece. Um, the name of this piece is Madame X. Um, and this is an interesting story in art history. When this was first painted, this strap of her dress um, was here against her arm instead of up here around her um, shoulder. Uh, it caused such a scandal, like horrific scandal, that um, John Singer Sargent um, had to, um, uh, he actually had to uh, repaint it um, to cover up um, where he had originally put the strap um, down on her arm and, and move it up onto her shoulder because literally the idea that it had slid down was scandalous. Um, and so um, again, this is called Madam X. Uh, it's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, um, and she's beautiful. Go see her if you can. Um, then um, I talked to you about Monet. I talked to you about Degas and his ballet dancers and his horses. Um, I talked to you about Renoir and Seurat, Cassad. Um, who else have I not talked to you about? We talked about these. Um, this is um, considered the most famous um, Matisse ever, the woman in the hat. Um, and this is um, at the, um, this is uh, a, a really important piece called The Dance. Um, and there's one of these um, in uh, Philadelphia. Um, so we have a lot of really important art near us. Um, then I'm gonna scroll this way. Okay, so this is, um, you know, when we were in, um, you know, abstract, when we were in expressionism, surrealism, um, this is Deshirico. Um, and so this is another one of these guys that's surrealism. But what's great about Deshirico's work is there always seems to be sort of something hidden in the background that's really scary. Um, so if you're really looking for art that seems somewhat like psychologically disturbing, um, Deshirico is your dude. Like, we're not sure what's going on there. We're not sure who he is or what he's going to do, but he's really scary. And this open cart 
part is also scary. And it's a little girl playing with a hoop. Um, and she seems to be running towards this thing that's very frightening. Um, his artwork is really good. Um, this is Dali, um, the persistence of memory. Um, and we see, you know, the, the ants and the bugs and the, um, you know, the, the, the melting clocks and the water that seems to just stop at the end of the square. Um, again, this is our surrealism, uh, things that are not real, that, that blend with things that are real, a real landscape, but mixed with um, these objects that really couldn't be there. Um, this is Miro. Uh, he did a lot of these interesting um, rounded shapes and figures. And this is Miro's version of, of a of, uh, de Hoc painting from uh, the time that Vermeer painted. Um, this is uh, Miro's version of this painting. And when you sit and look at it, you can see it. Like here's his hat, here's his mandolin, here's the dog. You know, you can, you can pull apart the pieces um, barely, but they're there. Um, and so that's Miro. Um, let's see what else did we not cover? Um, we covered, oh, Guernica. Uh, this is, um, uh, in Spain. I believe it's at the Prado. Um, and this is about the Spanish civil war. Um, a lot of collage here, um, and a lot of really disturbing imagery of people being killed and bombs and, and, um, you know, terror and, uh, it's, you know, Picasso was amazing, uh, really amazing. This is Picasso's blue period. This is his line period. Um, so we see that. Oh, boy, look at all the things that if we were in person, I would definitely be teaching you all of these. Um, but we're just, we don't have time. So this was um, the Guggenheim. Um, so remember, we talked about Frank Lloyd Wright feeling that, you know, a building should match its surroundings. And so he, he made this beautiful um, spiral so that he could preserve the frontier of the building and then have a larger and larger space as you go up. So, so that it didn't feel so cramped down at the at the ground level. If he had brought this all the way down to the ground level, it would have felt crowded on that corner. And so by using this sort of cone design, he is able to free up space here at the ground level, but still have enough gallery space at the top. Um, this is Calder uh, a sculpture, um, a kinetic sculpture. Um, they move. Um, and uh, they are perfectly weighted that it, it takes very little for them to move. Um, uh, you can literally, um, at the National Gallery of Art, you can walk up to one of them and blow on it, and it will just spin and spin and spin and spin. Um, and uh, they're really quite cool. Um, who else? We did this, we did that, we just did all these. Okay, and then I bring you to, at the very end, I bring you to Just Because. Um, this is called American Gothic by Grant Wood. Um, and so this is a really famous painting of a man and uh, it, this is actually his sister. Um, a lot of people think it's his daughter or his wife, it's actually his sister. Um, and so, um, uh, and you know, this is just sort of um, a lot of, uh, um, frequently called Americana, right? Uh, George O'Keefe, famous for painting flowers and skulls. Um, she was married to our photographer, Alfred Stieglitz, the one that did the steerage. Uh, they were married and, um, uh, you know, he photographed her and she painted lots of things with him and it was very cool. Um, and her work is um, colorful and stunning and beautiful. Um, this is Nighthawks by Edward Hopper. Um, and this is a really famous painting simply because it – there are so many questions about it. It's dark, it's nighttime, like what's in the window? What are people doing? Why are they there so late at night? Why is this guy over here and those people are over there? And what exactly is happening here? Um, and it just feels very um, mysterious. Um, it's awesome, it's a beautiful painting. Uh, this is called Christina's World by Andrew Wythe. Um, What's amazing about this is um, uh, uh, sh uh, she suffered from, this is Christina, the neighbor of, of wife, um, she suffered from a Charcot-Marie Tooth disease, which is like a degenerative nerve disease. And she would often go out, um, Her she couldn't walk, her family would often take her out into the 
into the woods, not in the woods, into the field and just let her lay in the field in the sun because she wanted to. Um, but the interesting way and in the angle at which her arm is and, and the way that she seems to be crawling back to the house with her hair blowing in the wind, she looks abandoned. Um, but um, she wasn't. Her family loved her very much. This is at the MoMA. Yeah, this is at the MoMA, the uh, Museum of Modern Art in, in Manhattan. Um, yeah, so you can go and see that. Um, this is David Hockney, um, a British artist. Um, and and th these pieces is called The Big Splash. Um, and this piece is just wonderful. Um, it's sort of a new um, kind of um, exploration of less um, less realism, but, but with without being terribly abstracted. Um, it's it's an interesting combination between the two. Um, and uh, Hockney is an amazing, amazing artist. Uh, there was just uh, two years ago, so 2019, there was a, a huge Hockney exhibit, um, uh, both in France and in um, America. Uh, and he is, he's very old and wheelchair bound. Um, and so, um, uh, I was very lucky to see the collection of his work. So that's just some uh, works that, you know, sometimes I just want you to see. Um, I hope that you enjoyed Late Europe, um, and I will see you again for whatever our next unit is. Um, I hope to see you soon. Bye, guys.